Hello chaps and chapettes and welcome to a look at the history of Australia's gunboat HMAS or as originally named HMCS Protector. Now before you go correcting me and telling me that's the Canadian standard, HMCS stands for Her Majesty's Canadian Ship, originally it stood for Her Majesty's Colonial Ship. The gunboat HMAS Protector was ordered in 1883 by the South Australian government it is a time when each Australian state has its own naval force. Um, the colonial naval, navy at the time uh, was a bit of a mixed match hodgepodge of a thing. Different ships, different, uh, different states having different navies. Of course, they were all under the guiding arm of the Royal Navy at the time. The main reason for the ship was the possibility of a Russian invasion. Yeah, I know it sounds strange, Russians invading Australia. Uh, Russians do actually very much enjoy, uh, was it camel meat, I think it is, from Australia? Anyway, that, that's getting off point. But Russia was uh, currently having a war with Japan, and their ships were actually limping to Australia for repair and basically to seek uh, sort of a safe place and the Australians didn't really want this at the time because they didn't want to get involved in the war. So the threat of a Russian invasion was still a thing that they were a bit wary of. So the South Australian government made the initial steps towards establishing its own little naval force with Sir William Jarvis, uh, the then governor of South Australia who was a strong advocate of the colonial navy. This led to him ordering HMAS Protector in 1883. The ship was built at a cost of £65,000 at the time, paid by the South Australian government. The ship would form part of the Colonial Coastal Defence Force. The ship was built by William Armstrong and Co. Newcastle on Tyne, laid down on, the, on November 1882. The ship is uh, based on a flat iron gunboat design, but was one of the largest of all the types, um, and was classified actually as a light cruiser, um, with a displacement of 920 tonnes, a length of 55 metres with a beam of 17 metres, and a drought of 3.7 metres. Using two compound steam engines, uh, basically you imagine a piston engine inside, inside of a steam engine, that's kind of how it works got a total of 1,500 horsepower, uh, which gave her a top cruising speed of 14 knots, 26 kilometres per hour. For her size, Protector was exceptionally well armed. Uh, the largest weapon was one 203mm Armstrong Rifle Breech Loading Bow Cannon, the gun itself weighing 12 tonnes. It could fire a 18, sorry, a 180 pound projectile almost 7,000 metres. Uh, that's, that's a fairly good job. Uh, the second armament included five 152mm Woolwich Armstrong rifle barreled breech loading guns, four 47mm or three pounder guns, five 10 barreled Gatling guns. The crew had 90, um, the, sorry, the crew of 90 had 200 45 caliber Martini Henry rifles and around 100 revolvers on board. Along with this, they had 100 cutlasses and 30 boarding pikes. So, all in all, the ship was very well armed. In 1884, the ship was launched from the famous Ellick Yard, most commonly known for the first real protected cruisers, uh, the Chilean Esmeralda. Uh, which was one of the first real protected sort of cruisers with the quick firing guns and all of that malarkey. After be being fully fitted out, the ship was officially commissioned on the 19th of June, no, eight, sorry, of the 19th of June 1884, under the command of John C. P. Walcott of the Royal Navy. On this day, she undertook her first sea trials as well, sailing for four hours with an average speed of 14 knots, along with testing all of her guns in the open seas. That would have been one heck of a sight to see, and I imagine would have made some, some noise. On the 27th of June, 1884, she left Newcastle upon Tyne, arriving in Gibraltar. On the 5th of July, she then sailed to Malta and Port Said in Egypt. 
the ship the ship then went on to the sewers and then rigged her sails and began sailing to Colombo in Sri Lanka. Finally, she left port on the 25th of August to head to her new home in Adelaide, South Australia. On the 30th of September, HMCS Protector finally arrived in Port Adelaide, South Australia. For the next 15 years, Protector became a familiar sight on the coastal waters of Adelaide, uh, conducting training exercises along the port, um, a a along the ports and visiting various different ports as well. Uh, she sailed all over the place around here, uh, mainly being down uh, towards an area where we call Semaphore. Um, and yeah, so very cool. And I hope maybe in the background you'll be seeing the gun that lays down at Semaphore now. 1900, the Boxer Rebellion. Now, the boxers were a secretive, uh, sort of, and, uh, secretive bunch, basically. Uh, the Boxer Rebellion in 1899 was a movement uh, counting anywhere from 50 to 100,000 members, uh, looking to cause the downfall of the Qing Dynasty. The fear of being westernised was quite large in China, and they really didn't want people coming in. Australia answered the call to arms from the Royal Navy, to aid in actions in China. For legal reasons, the ship had to temporarily be commissioned by the Royal Navy and to serve under it, and not serve, well, to serve outside of the South Australian waters. On the 6th of August, 1900, now proudly flying the Royal Navy's ensign, uh, the white ensign from her stern, she sailed to Sydney to take on coal and then on to Brisbane to take an additional amount of small arms and uh, provisions along with Captain Sir William Creswell. Now, Sir William Creswell was a retired lieutenant from the Royal Navy and emigrated to Australia in 1879 to become a farmer. He was looking at to become a cattle farmer. However, a stint in the Northern Territory convinced him that outback life was not for him. Uh, whilst visiting Adelaide in 1885, he stumbled across an old colleague and decided to rejoin the forces. He was uh, he was a strong lobbyist for an Australian naval force as well uh, to supplement the Royal Navy at the time uh, in Sydney. In the 1900s, he was appointed as the Commandant of the Queensland Maritime Defence Force. However, was uh, he was soon released uh, of this role to Captain HMS Protector. Later in his life, he would go on to form, uh, well, help form Australia's Navy. Uh, for his actions, he was knighted. Uh, he was knighted and he also gained the rank of Vice Admiral. On the 9th of September, 1900, HMS Protector had reached Hong Kong. After refuelling um, and getting a few supplies on board, the ship headed for Shanghai. However, the use of the shallow drought vessels, uh, such as HMS Protector, was actually not called for. Uh, nevertheless, the vessel, vessel carried out a lot of work uh, in the Gulf of Pichili, um, mainly carrying dispatches to other ships and other vessels, uh, or doing survey work. On the 7th of November, however, the ship headed back to Australia, uh, which was a stroke of luck for the ship. Uh, it made the ceremonies creating the Australian Commonwealth, uh, as she made it back in time for that on the 1st of January 1901. The ship back in the commander, command of C.J. Clare, then headed home to Adelaide, where she arrived on the 6th of January 1901. On arrival, Commander Clare was interviewed by the press. It is interesting to know that ours was the most healthy ship in the station, whilst nearly every other man of war had from 15 to 20% sick, our sick list was practically nil, with the exception of a few cases of influenza. With regards to the ship, she was certainly the most heavily armed vessel for her size on the China Station. Both Admiral Seymour and Admiral Person, who inspected us in Sydney, said, She was an efficient ship, said Clare, proud of their effort in China. Uh, he was actually the second in command on that trip, uh, underneath the captainage of Sir William Cresswell. In 1911, um, 
Serving as a training ship for the past 10 years and patrolling the Australian coastline, HMCS Protector received a new prefix. Uh, she would now be known as HMAS Protector, after the formation of the Australian Royal Navy. In 1912, Protector underwent a number of alterations and a few additions, the largest of which was removing the 12-ton, 203mm bow-mounted cannon. This led to a redesign of the ship's bow, uh, raising the main deck level slightly uh, for a more comfortable ride in rough weather. Um, and she operated until 1913. She was still uh, participating in coastal patrols uh, when in late 1913 HMS Protector became the tender to the then turreted monitor HMAS Ca uh, Cerberus. The ship berthed at Williamstown. HMAS Cerberus had become a bit of a training uh, a training vessel and uh, a harbour defence ship due to the fact her boilers no longer worked and most of her most of the inner workings of the ship had seized. Uh, a lot of crew members were listed as working on the ship because the naval training school on the mainland was not yet open, so they had to get paid somehow. In 1914, with the outbreak of the First World War, HMAS Protector was once more to head to the oceans. She sailed to Sydney to meet up with two of Australia's new E-Class submarines, AE-1 and AE-2, where she would act as the parent ship and escort on the, for them. On the 28th of August, the three ships set sail as part of Australia's naval and military expeditionary forces to capture the German New Guinea colonies. Following the surrender of the three colonies on the 17th of September, uh, 1914, HMS Protector remained in Rebel as one of the guard ships. So, a slight editor's note and a slight bit of extra information. Uh, Madang and the steamer Sumatra were both captured by HMAS Australia and HMAS Protector. Uh, Protector actually was part of the uh, fleet holding the two ships in port uh, in uh, New Britain. Uh, so yeah, just a bit of extra information there, and I thought that was quite interesting. So uh, photos will be added as I speak, uh, and you can see them now. On the 4th of October 1914, HMS uh, Phantom required an escort back to Sydney, so HMS Protector uh, and the survey ship headed home. Protector remained in Australian waters, uh, mainly patrolling around Melbourne and performing minesweeping action. However, in October of 1915, HMS Protector was sent to the Cocos Islands in the Indian Ocean to report on the state of a uh, German cruiser. They discovered that the Emden uh, was in fact very much decommissioned and was not going to be sailing anywhere. In December of 1915, HMAS Protector had returned to Australian waters, and for the remainder of the war was employed as a tender to the HMAS Cerberus, whilst going on a few sea patrols between Sydney and Cape Howe, and the ongoing minesweeping actions in the Victorian waters. In the post-war period, she continued to work as Cerberus's tender. In 1920, uh, May of that year, HMAS Protector carried an advanced party to Flinders Navy Depot on Western Port Bay in preparation for the official opening of the uh, depot, which took place on the 1st of September 1920. For 37 years, HMCS, HMS and HMAS Protector served, served Australia faithfully. However, as almost a mean April Fool's joke, on the 1st of April 1921, HMAS Protector lost her identity and was renamed after the ship she had to tender for so many years. From now on, she was HMAS Cerberus, and became the main tender to Flinders Naval Depot, which would go on to get the name of HMAS Cerberus itself. The name would only last three years, as in June of 1924, she was sold off to a Mr. J. Hill of Melbourne for a mere sum, sum of £677. She was resold in 1931 uh, to Victoria Lightridge Co., where she, the ship was renamed Sir Sydney uh, and would see out her years as a barge carrying wool. 
However, the story is not yet over. In July of 1943, the ship once more sailed into military service, being requisitioned by the United States Army Forces in Australia. But now Barge was going to help ferry supplies back to America, ba American bases from uh, where they were in, 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 in Australia and those areas. HMS Protector was not keen on leaving Australian waters, however. While under tow, she uh, got damaged by a collision with a tug off Gladstone, um, and, well, it basically was abandoned on the Heron Reef, where the old gunboat still remains to this day, serving as a breakwater and a protector to some of Australia's sea life. The wreck can still be visited today at low tide. Um, it has become a, a, a favourite snorkelling spot for many visitors of the reef area there, Protector's uh, stern 150mm gun still sits proudly in South Australia, facing out uh, from Semaphore Beach, uh, with one of her 100mm quick-firing guns on display proudly at the Elizabeth and Salisbury Naval Club. The ship's wheel sits on display in the Royal Australian Naval Heritage Centre in Sydney. And finally, Following an overhaul of the Royal Australian Naval's Battle Honours, the ship was retroactively awarded honours for China in 1900 and Rabaul in 1914. Thank you so much for watching this episode, and I hope you've found it somewhat interesting and informative. Uh, if you would like more content from me like this, uh, usual thing, comment, subscribe, yada yada yada, bell icon, you know, the, the usual drill, that, all that jazz. You can also join the Discord channel, uh, the Kaiju Club. I'd love to see you in there, more than having you chat away about things. Nice bunch of lads in there. Anyway, thank you so much. Thank you again, and I will see you next time. This is Scree out. Bye-bye.